So let's get going. Nutrients and water quality. Um, why a challenge oriented around these two things? What I want to do is let you watch a very quick little video, which is one of the resources that have been suggested for you um, in the list of resources. A really good general presentation that will take about a minute and a half. So we'll just hope that it works properly. Let's go. Nutrient pollution is a widespread national problem and is well documented in places like the Chesapeake Bay, the Mississippi River Basin, and Puget Sound. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are a natural part of the ecosystem. They support the growth of aquatic plants, but human activities cause an excess of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment. Surface and groundwater becomes polluted, creating a serious problem known as nutrient pollution. Nutrient pollution can affect you and your family's health, as drinking water supplies and places where we like to swim and fish. Excess nutrients can also cause an explosion of algae growth called algal blooms. These can be foamy, scummy, or a thick mat of slime on the surface of the water or along the beach. Some algal blooms are harmful because they produce toxins that can make people sick. These blooms also hurt tourism, reduce property values, and drive up water treatment costs. The nutrients move downstream, killing fish and creating large dead zones where no aquatic life can survive. It's one of the most serious water pollution issues facing our nation. Nutrient pollution comes from farms, lawn fertilizer, pet waste, city streets, faulty septic systems, and treatment plants. Limiting nutrient pollution from excess nitrogen and phosphorus will protect people's health, support the economy, and keep America's waters safe for swimming and fishing. Awareness is the first step in preventing and reducing nutrient pollution. Learn what you can do to make a difference at epa.gov slash nutrient pollution. So thank you for bearing with me. That's a nice introduction to nutrients. Um, and again, when we talk about nutrients, we're concerned about nutrients in excess supply. Nutrients are absolutely essential to life, of course. So, um, and it turns out that typically one nutrient or another is in the societies or those that embrace. Oh, well, I got it. Okay, so um, one nutrient or another tends to be in shortest supply, and in the Great Lakes, this tends to be phosphorus. So, adding more phosphorus causes trouble. In the Chesapeake, it tends to be nitrogen. Um, most uh, saltwater systems, nitrogen is a bigger issue, more short supply. So. You can just plan on too many nutrient, nutrients equaling eutrophication or excess algae or aquatic plants in a system. And of course, that can result in some pretty serious problems such as near shore nuisance algal blooms, sometimes harmful algal blooms, um, and a bunch of other problems that we'll talk about as well. So let's tell a story. One of the beauties of ArcGIS or of any kind of a mapping um, a visualization is the, how well it tells stories. Um, and to help get you started, I'd like to tell you a little story about Great Lakes, the Great Lakes. So in, 19, in the 1970s, the Great Lakes were in pretty rough shape, really significant eutrophication problems, nuisance algae blooms in the near shore waters. Um, and a lot of it was caused by point sources or, or pollution coming from one distinct source, much of it from wastewater treatment plants. So in the 70s and 80s, internationally, um, the governments got together and set goals for reducing pollution and managing point sources. And in the late 80s, wow, we were really congratulating ourselves. It was a tremendous success. And just as an example, Lake Ontario uh, went from 21 micrograms per liter, and of course these are averages in the offshore part of the lake, in 1975 to about 10 micrograms in the early 1990s. Really phenomenal. Um, really good job. Uh, so is that the end of the story? Well, heck no. Um, before we go on, I just want to point out that the goals that were set for phosphorus, are, they're really low, low 
populations. We're looking at in Lake Superior five micrograms per liter. Um, and then in the shallower lakes with different land uses, we're talking as much as 15 micrograms per liter down here in Western Lake Erie. Um, but these are pretty small numbers, as you can see. So what is the rest of the story? In the 1990s, we suddenly saw a resurgence of nuisance algae in the near shore area. Um, we've seen more harmful algal blooms from 2000 on. There's been really major near shore problems, particularly in Lake Erie, but not just Lake Erie. Um, we can also end up with, as the video showed you, dead zones, and there's been some in Lake Erie where, where their oxygen levels are dropped by decomposing algae and algal respiration to the point that fish can't survive. So we've got some really serious issues. Um, but the weird thing that scientists have spent quite a while trying to figure out is that at the same time we're seeing these problems along shore and that looks like it's caused by more phosphorus, we're seeing what you're seeing here in, these, in the image, the arrows that point downward mean phosphorus levels have been dropping over the last 10 years. This is a 10-year trend. Um, Lake Superior levels are in really good shape, so we're not so concerned about those little upticks. You can see Lake Erie has a lot of issues. Um, so we're trying to figure this out. It's a big question, and we have some good, good theories now. Now, I want you to note that this is um, data and visualization from greatlakesmonitoring.org, which is one of the really good sources for data that we're going to be showing you later. So what's going on, really quickly, we have a problem with an invasive, two invasive mussel species. And you can see them up in the top right. One is the quagga mussel, which can live in quite deep water on soft substrates. And one is the zebra mussel, which occupies any hard surface it can find. Now, Lake Superior, we're pretty lucky. We uh, don't have a lot of problems with this. But for the rest of the lakes, or many of the rest of the lakes, mussels are a huge problem. Here's what happens. Basically, they're really good filters, and they filter algae and other particles out of the water for food. They are basically filtering out the nutrients and all the organic gunk that fish would like to be eating. So you can see this comparison. Here's without mussels, um, 70 to 80% um, reduction down to 5% for phytoplankton. Um, I don't want to get into the numbers. I just want you to note that all of that nutrition and food for fish is ending up down in the bottom of these lakes. So it's a very big issue. And that's why we're seeing phosphorus levels actually dropping below those target goals we had set in some of these lakes. So it's actually making the lakes in the offshore lake parts of the lakes not have enough food 